Mark 4, your reference to Mark 4 and um, Acts 2, 42, where it is the continuity and the doctrine of the apostles. That's pretty much what I'm going to talk about today. But um, let's start with, um, we're going to pray, but I want to read First Peter first. Hallelujah. Thank you. It's, uh, like, I um, bless God for your fellowship with you and uh, this church. Hallelujah. Everybody doing okay? Amen. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So if you look at Second Peter, just want to call your attention to a few things very quickly. Second Peter chapter number one. I've promised myself I'll, I'll go slow. <laughs> go slow. That's that's Nigeria speak for traffic hold up. In, in Nigeria, we don't say traffic hold up. We say go slow. There's a go slow over there. Just everything is slow. So I'm going to go slow today, but firmly. Uh, okay. All right. Sorry, I'm going to grab my phone so I keep track of the time. 12. Okay, good. Hallelujah. Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 3. Second Peter 1 3 says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things, everything, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, because we know him, or through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby by these promises have been given to us exceeding, um, by his power has have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these promises, we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lost. Beside this, giving all diligence, and it was, Pastor, Pastor was talking about um, discipline, diligence here. Add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, to godliness, love or brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, charity. Verse 8, for if these things be in you, and abound and increase, abound. They are really there a lot. They, those things, will make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Verse 9 is pretty much where I'm going. It says, But he that lacks these things is blind. Circle that. He that lacks these things is blind. They are Christians, they are blind, they cannot see afar off. And they have forgotten that they have been poured from their sins. Yeah. Is it possible? How, how can a Christian forget? 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 Really? Are you serious? Forget? They will be um, forgiven of uh, poured from their old sins? Apparently it's possible. That's mm -hmm. what Peter is saying here. Apparently if you are not careful, you can forget it. You can live as if you have not been forgiven. Like Jesus has not died for you. They can forget. Look at what he says next. Wherefore, the rather brethren, because of that, because it's possible to forget, give diligence or discipline to make your calling and election sure. For if we do these things, if you do these things, you shall never fail or you will not forget. Let's put it that way. Now, uh, one more, uh, a few more verses. 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Because of everything I've said, wherefore, I will not be forgetful or negligent to put you always in remembrance. In other words, I will need to remind you. Mm -hmm. I am reminding you right now. Yeah. I'm not going to forget to remind you. Look at what it says. Put you in remembrance. That's the King James English. It really, it really means remind you of these things, though you know them. You say, I know them already. Yes. But you need to be reminded too. It has to be a constant, consistent thing done again and again and again and again and again. We never get tired of this story. That's right, that's right. Jesus died. What Jesus did for us. We never ever come to the place where we say, I've heard it. It's enough. Mm -hmm. Look at what it says here. Though you know them and you already established in the present truth, you already know them, but you still need to be reminded constantly. And that is why we do Bible study. Yeah. That is why we come to church on Wednesdays. Well, well, attend church on Bible study on Wednesdays. Come to church on Sundays. That is why Acts 2 42 says we continue in the doctrine yeah. or the teaching of the apostles. Yeah. They continue daily. Yes. It said that. Look at the next verse. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I'm in this body or in this tabernacle, to stir you up 
by putting you in remembrance again. And look at the next verse. Uh, look at verse 15. Although the Lord has showed me, I'm going to take up this tabernacle. Verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my death or decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Three times in about four verses. We never get tired of these things. We must never get tired of these things. They have co to constantly always be in front of our eyes. I like to um, talk about John 1 8. I mean, jo Joshua, not John. Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate in it day and night so that you will observe to do. You meditate first, then you will observe consistency in it, and then you can do it. And then um, you will prosper and make your way, uh, you will do well and make your way prosperous. Something like you will have good success, it says. So it says, the book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth. It's a book. What's it doing in my mouth? It's a book. Why is it in my mouth? I'm always meditating on it. I'm always co confessing it. It's never going to leave my attention. I will never be distracted from it. That's what it's saying. It's my constant meditation. It's my constant meals, if you like. I'm always thinking about it, always muttering it. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we, we come humbly, but we come boldly. We, we, we do not come timidly at all into your presence. We come dancing and rejoicing Amen. what you have done for who you have made us. You, you said come boldly. So we're here. So we thank you for revelation knowledge today. Thank you for opening our understanding. Thank you for enlightening our understanding. Opening our eyes that we may behold, like um, David said, wondrous things out of your law. So that at the end of today, at the end of this service, I mean, we will have been more conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus. The work of the ministry will have been more done. And we have, we have come um, closer to that image, that statue of the measure of the fullness of Christ which you have in store for us. We give you thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, uh, with my background of the scripture I read in Second Peter, that's, that's my background. That's kind of where I, I want to remind you some of the most foundational, most basic things that, that uh, build our faith up. Hallelujah. So it's really a story. If you look at, go to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. It's, it's the resurrection story, you know, which I'm sure everybody has had about, um, known. Everybody will know about. Look at the Lord Jesus in Mark 24. This is where he got up from the dead. The disciples are scared. They're wondering what's going on. Um, they, they're not believing that he's, uh, he's alive now. So if you look at 20, 24 verse 1, it says, Now, Luke 24 verse 1. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, they came unto the sepulcher bringing spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. They're mainly women. And thank God for women. <laughs> they got up early. Um, uh, commentators said they, they must have been there around 3 a.m., between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. You know, where, I know, some, someone like my mom, restless like that, something is going on. Ah, <laughs> kind of thing. They won't be able to sleep. You know, you know when things happen, you, you, sometimes you sleep, you wake up like every two hours. Yeah, so this was the opportunity to go there and um, um, give him some ointment to, to the body of the Lord Jesus. So when they got there, they found those, in verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. They entered in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, apparently angels. And they were afraid, they bowed down their faces to the earth. They said unto, him, unto them, why seek you the living among the dead? Thank God. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day, rise again. And they remembered his words. Apparently, they did not believe it also. They remember that he said it. Oh, he said, that's true. He said that. Verse 9, And they returned from the sepulchre and told these things unto the eleven and all the rest. If you read the other accounts, um, Matthew or Mark, they did not believe them. They thought they were idle tales. Actually, it says it here also. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them like 
idle tales. It's like saying, these women have come again. You know, all these stories, and they believed them not. You need to circle that or underline that. They did not believe it. They were like, no, we don't believe it. That's just tales. By moonlight. They arose, then arose Peter and ran onto the sepulchre. Something stared him up, and stooping down, he beheld the linen cloth, clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which had come to pass. So he was wondering. In verse 13, two disciples, two of them went that same day. That's part of the group that was with 11. They went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score four longs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, the Lord himself drew near and went with them. And their eyes were held that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what are you guys talking about? What's, why are you so sad? Verse 18. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered unto them, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And has not known these things which have come to pass in these days? I mean, don't you have Facebook? You don't watch CNN? You don't know what's happening? And, um, and he said, What things? The Lord's being coy here. Was being coy like, yeah, What are you talking about? Yeah, What things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed, and in word before God and all the people. So to them, he was still just a prophet. He was still just like Elijah or uh, Isaiah. Uh, where was I? Before God and all the people. Verse 20, and the chief priests and our rulers, they delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it should have been him that will have redeemed Israel. The question is, did he not do it? They redeemed Israel already. They just did not know it. At this point, there's no, redemp- there is no other redemption coming in. He has died. He has, he's been raised from the dead. Israel has been redeemed. It depends on which Israel you're talking about. There's an Israel of God. Anyway, let's move on. Um, where is it? And besides, thank, thank you. And besides all these, today's the third day since those things were done. Yes, 22. And certain women also of our company among um, made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre, 23. When they found out his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that it was a light. Certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and they found it even as um, so as the women had said. But he, they saw not, 25. Then said he unto them, O fool, slow of. He wasn't very pleased. I don't think he was mad. He was like, Oh man, you didn't get it. Slow of heart to believe. All that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, from the very beginning, very start, beginning at Moses, all the prophets, how many, how many of the prophets? All of them. All of the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Not some. All the prophets, all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, where they went, and made and he made as if he was going to go further, and they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent, and he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass as his, they sat at meat, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. We can stop there for now. I'm gonna read the rest of it oh, for, um, definitely. So here are two disciples walking on the way to um, another city. You know, uh, they did not know the Lord. The Lord Jesus joined them. They did not realize it was him. They completely missed the boat. I mean, missed them. Now, look at verse, uh, one verse there says, um, they were restrained from seeing him. You know, that makes it sound like it was God doing it. I don't believe that. I don't believe it was God saying, don't, you cannot recognize Jesus now. It was their unbelief, their own unbelief that blinded them. And one of them said, we thought he was a prophet. They saw him purely as a prophet. They, they thought he was going to come and redeem Israel physically, deliver Israel from the Romans. That is what blinded them. Jesus was not hidden from them. Jesus was standing next to them. It was the way I see Pastor Carl right now, it's the way they were seeing Jesus. They just did not see it. It was not that God did a special thing, the blindness over their eyes. They did not see him because of their unbelief. Unbelief is a problem. Can we? Well, it's a problem in this case. So what did Jesus do 
to help them. He, he gave them the truth. He said, oh, fool, slow of heart to believe what? To believe. Believe what? The scriptures. Believe all that the prophets have spoken. These things were supposed to happen. Jesus did not say, the Lord Jesus did not say, look at me. It's me. Cleopas. Hello, Cleopas. He didn't say that. What he did was to point them to scripture, to the truth. If you see Jesus here, you won't need to see him physically. If you see him in your heart, this is where you really need to see him. Some people will say today, I wish I was there when Jesus was walking the face of the earth. I don't, I don't think I wish, I wish I was there. I see him here. It's enough. See him in scripture. What the scripture says about him is enough. He did not try to convince them with his physical appearance. He tried to convince them by opening to them the scripture. Look at what he says. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expanded unto them. Expound means exegesis, means teaching, means breaking it down, means slicing it and cutting it this way so you can see it, means dissection. It says, he expanded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now, listening to, I mean, social media age, YouTube, Facebook, you hear all kinds of things people say about Jesus, about the gospel. For some people, it's just about eschatology. Oh, the mark of the beast. I mean, some people are so engrossed in that kind of stuff. Eschatology, the mark of the beast. Who is the Antichrist? Well, it's about Jesus. Only, nothing else. In fact, if you look at Acts 19 in verse 10. Sorry, Revelation, not Acts. Revelation 19.10. John was a revelator or the one who saw the revelation. John there saw an angel or an elder and was going to bow, bow down to an end to the elder and worship him. The elder said, don't do it. I'm a fellow servant. I, I bear the testimony of Jesus. He says, worship God because um, ah, it just left me. It says there, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, what John, 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 wait. Everything you've seen in Revelation, all the re apocalyptic images, somebody, all the people riding on horses, everything, um, destruction happening, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Another version says, the testimony of Jesus is the essence of prophecy. Whether it's prophecy from the Old Testament, or prophecy from the Old New Testament, or prophecy today, the testimony of Jesus, every prophecy, the point in the direction of Jesus only. Romans 10 4 says, um, The end of Christ is the end of the law. Christ is the goal to which the law was ever pointed. So that's what Jesus is saying here. Here, it says, um, This verse says, verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. It's not about eschatology, it's not about Israel, honestly. For, for real. It's, about, it's not about motivational thoughts. Oh, leadership skills from scripture. That's not what it is. Of course, scripture says a little thing, I mean, about everything. There's something about all of these things, about the end times, about eschatology, about Israel, about Mark of the Beast and all that. But the goal, the essence, the, the bulk, the weight of it is all about Jesus. If you see anything else, in scripture, apart from Jesus, you have read it wrongly. And there's blindness there. These people saw Jesus wrongly. He's a prophet. He's going to deliver Israel, like physical material Israel, national Israel. That was the blindness. That was why they could not see him. And the cure to that was to see Jesus in the scriptures. When you see Jesus correctly, he enters into your heart. I do not believe that he vanished from their eyes. I believe it was the moment when they saw, ha, ah, Jesus in the scripture, that moment, they stopped seeing physically. I believe it was still there. I believe it was now in their heart. They now got it. They did not need, we don't need physical evidence, really. It's enough to see in scripture. 
Hallelujah. Look at, he says, their eyes were opened, they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. He says, he, uh, he broke bread. A lot of people have seen commentaries saying something like, when they, uh, when they uh, did, um, broke the bread and drank the wine. I don't think it is. It was just, we're having a meal. It was just a meal. Some, somebody, called that was, somebody said that was the Eucharist in some denomination. No, it was just, they were just having a meal. But it taught them the scripture. When they got it, finally they said, ah, it's Jesus. This is Jesus. The only way to see Jesus is through the scriptures. The beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Verse 14, John 1. And the word dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Hallelujah. The word, word there. The word, word in John 1, 1 means, lo, it's logos in the Greek. And it means knowledge. It means big idea. God's, everything that God is saying to us is in Christ. Okay, so look at verse 32 of this same Luke 24. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, while he opened to us the scripture? That's what he did. He didn't try to convince them by saying, look at me. It's me. Don't you remember me? Look at my hair. Blonde? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Look at me. He opened to them the scriptures and somebody says, may you have heart burn. Somebody, I was listening to somebody preach all this a few, uh, some time ago, said they had heartburn. You know, hopefully you will have one today. Okay, our hearts were burning within us while he spoke. And to, that's, that's revelation knowledge. That's what revelation knowledge does to you. You perceive your heart will burn with that scripture. Okay, look at verse 33. Continues, they rose up the same hour. They returned to Jerusalem. So these were people who said, come, it's too late. Pass, eat with us, stay with us. They could not sit down anymore. It was late at night. They just said, okay, let's go back. So they returned to Jerusalem and found that 11 gathered together. And they that were with them, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told them, they told the 11 and the other people, those things that were done in the way and how it was known unto, of them in breaking of bread. So essentially they went back and told them, I mean, if it was me, what I would be like was like, you won't believe what happened. You won't believe who came to my house today. Which, Jesus, the Lord Jesus. He came, we, he ate bread with us. And the others will have been like, no, whoa, what, what did he say? What did he look like? What did, he, did he say anything? They would have said, he pointed us to the scriptures. Look at verse 35 again. They told those things that were done in the way. What things were done in the way? He taught them the scriptures. He opened the scriptures to them. That's what happened in the way and how it was one of them breaking of bread. So they must have gotten here and started preaching to the rest of them. It, was, it must have opened to them the scriptures from Isaiah and Jeremiah pointing to him and all that. You know, and as they were speaking, Jesus, verse 36, they were speaking, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, peace be unto you. That's very comforting. <laughs> peace be unto you. Okay, thank you. And they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Now, look at their reaction here. It's Jesus. It's not an evil spirit. This is not the devil standing in front of them. But they were, they were scared. You know, that shows you the level of word, if I can put it that way, in their heart. This, this is Jesus. There's no fear. He is not the devil. He's not a demon. But they were still afraid. This is what unbelief will do. And you know, what God's word really puts in us, you know, what it really puts in us is an understanding of the nature and the character of God. You know, so it, it, there's some, it builds stuff. I, I don't want to say, I don't know if it's, stuff is the right word. It builds a, a picture, a foundation inside you where you know, I know God. Where you, where you have confidence in the nature and character of God, what God will do, what God will not do, what God is like, what Jesus is like. They were afraid. They, there was no reason to be afraid. This is Jesus. But their unbelief made them afraid. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? Verse 38, why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for his spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. 
And when he had thus spoken, this time he's going to show them physical evidence. He showed them his hands and his feet. And while they believed not, in spite of the physical evidence, in spite of, it's me, don't worry. They believed not for joy and wondered. He said unto them, okay, do you have any food here? And they said, uh, they gave me a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb and he took it and did eat them. My son doesn't like to eat fish. So we were looking at this scripture two days ago, two or three days ago. So I said, those of you in this house who don't like fish, you can say that Jesus ate fish. So if you want to be like Jesus, you got to eat fish. <laughs> so um, I don't think that convinced him. <laughs> so he ate a piece of fish. But, but, but I want you to notice in verse 44. Now, so you have to see this. They did not believe him. He showed them his hands. They did not believe. Do you have fish? They gave him fish. And do you have food? They gave him fish. He ate. But that was not what convinced them still. That's not what he used to convince them still. In spite of, look at the hole in my hand. In spite of, I just drank this coffee or I just ate this food. That's not what convinced them. What he was... What he's going to say next is, look, look, look at what he says in verse 44. These are the things. He's pointing them again back to the word. It is the word that will convince you. That has to convince you. Your conviction. Why are you healed? Because I, don't, I feel better. No. You are healed because the word said, I want to jump. The word said, <laughs> the word said so. That's the evidence. It's not because I feel better. It's not because the headache is gone or the cancer is gone. It's because the word said so, full stop. Right. Now he says here in verse 44, these, look at my hand, you see it. Look at my side, you see it. You have bread, yes, I will eat it. Your fish, I will eat it. But these are the words, in other words, these are the words I, I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written of me in, the, in Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding. The way they understood it, they finally got it was scripture. He opened their understanding. In other words, he's saying, look, scripture first, physical evidence next. It, you know, another way you can put this is saying, the word has worked. That's why you see this. It's because the word that promised, that said the Messiah must be killed, must be buried, and on the third day rise again, it has worked. Physical evidence. The word, thank you. That's the proof. The word worked first. Then this, the physical evidence. The what really convinced them was him, him, him pointing or his pointing to the scripture. These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you. In other words, I've been seeing these things. You just have not gotten them. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms, concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, thus it is written. Again, written. And thus it behoved Christ. It was only right for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And not just that. That's, a, that's, that's what it is. Not just that. But that repentance and remission of sins be preached in his name. Hallelujah. Now all we need to do, all you need to do is believe it. That's the only condition. Believe it. That's it. Now, what does it mean for me? It means, what does it mean for you? It means that if I believe this, as surely as Jesus was raised up from the dead, as surely as that, surely my sins have been remitted. Unless Jesus was not raised from the dead. As surely as he was raised from the dead, then my sins have been wiped out. It means there is therefore now no condemnation for me. Because Jesus did it. So this doctrine, doctrine of the apostles, forms the basis of everything that we believe. This is it. This is it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. You will see, this is repeated exactly the same way. 1 Corinthians 15. I mean, 
I personally feel sorry for a lot of people who, if you don't see Jesus in scripture, sorry, you have missed the boat. It's not about politics. A lot of, I mean, these days, electron cycles, it's just, for some people, it's just politics. I can never understand that. I can never understand that. It's, okay. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, verse 1. First Corinthians 15, 1. Uh, oh, okay. I'm ending in five minutes, I think. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, or I'm preaching unto you, the gospel which I preached unto you, which, this is what I preached unto you, which you have received, wherein you stand. The gospel which you have received and wherein you stand. In other words, this is where you stand. Verse 2, by which also you are saved. Let, let me read verse 1 again. Which I preached unto you, which you received, where you stand. In other words, this is where we stand. We don't stand anywhere else. This is it. In local parlance, in some areas, we say, we die here. This is it. This is, we, we live and die here. Die in court. Verse 2, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory, same thing about rem being rem um, in remembrance, wh what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Verse 3, for I delivered unto you f first principles. First of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins because Pilate killed him. That's not what he says. Christ died for our sins because we saw it on Calvary. No. Christ died for our sins according to, because the scripture said so. It is not the physical evidence. It is not because we saw it. It is because the scripture said it. So our faith is not the physical evidence. Our faith is what scripture said. And for emphasis, it's going to repeat in verse 3, for I delivered, um, verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I think he could have put verse 3 and 4 together. He could have said, Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised up from the dead, according to the scriptures. But for emphasis, he broke it down into two. He says, he, was, he died for our sins. One, according to the scriptures, was raised up from the dead, according to the scriptures. Emphasis. After that, the physical evidence. Peter saw him. 50 people saw him. And 500 people saw him at once. He appeared to other people. But the first thing, see in verse um, 3, where it says, first of all, you will see, this is King James. Other versions, they will say, first principle, or most importantly, first of all, Christ died for our sins. What did Jesus do? Died for our sin. He died for, for my sins. Now, in a sense, you can say, God did not really forgive our sins. You could say that. He did not even forgive our sins. Our sins were paid for. It were paid for. Jesus paid. I'm not just the one paying for it. Jesus paid for it. Somebody paid the price for, price for it. It was Jesus. It was the Lord Jesus. It wasn't just like, mm, go, don't worry. In a sense, it was. But in a, in a sense, it really was not. The price, whatever needed to be paid, whatever price needed to be paid, it was paid for, accounted for. We are legally truly justified Amen. made righteous right. hallelujah last things i will say Praise. in ephesians 1 in colossians 1 and pretty much all of the epistles that peter uh, that paul wrote you will find these prayers there we call them the pauline prayers these days and the one in ephesians says ephesians 1 from 15 chapter 1 verse 15 he says for the ever since i heard of your faith i have not stopped I have not ceased to pray for you. And that's what Paul said. In other words, I pray this prayer for you every single day. In fact, maybe several times a day. I have, do not cease to pray this prayer for you continually. What? Paul, are you praying for us? Now, if you're going to pray for me, usually I don't think you would send me a letter saying, this is what I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you, Taiwo, but these are the prayer points I'm praying for you. So Paul is making it here. I'm praying for you. I want you to know. I'm going to teach you also. I want you to know when I'm praying for you. That will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding. Remember we read in first, second Peter 
he that does not have these things in, him, in himself is blind, cannot see how far off, has forgotten that he was purged from his sins. And you remember in Luke 24, the eyes of the, the, the Lord opened the, uh, their eyes that they might understand the scriptures. Paul says that God will give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. One version says that the eyes of your spirit will be flooded with light. Hallelujah. So you can see the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. According to the working of my father, which is written in Christ, when risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Make this your prayer. Make this your prayer. I know you talk, you talk a lot here in this church about Brother Hagen, you know, but I again advises or suggested that we should pray these prayers for ourselves. You don't have to use those exact words in Ephesians 1. You can, you, if you get the essence of the prayer, just pray it on your own. Pray. Revelation, thank you, my eyes are open. Same thing in Colossians 1. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yes, sir.